How did we all do on that? How did we all do on that? Now, if you want to go to that site yourself, um, you are more than welcome to go play with that. Uh, it is a fun place to go. Um, because, uh, so there, Jeff Milner. Uh, you can just do jeffmilner.com slash backmasking. Um, I don't know why I included Stairway to, Stairway to Heaven in the background there, but um, how did we do? Did you get Sleep With Me, I'm Not Too Young? Um... By far my most, my, my favorite one, I, I'd imagine. Um, in any case, let's talk about today's topic. So, go ahead to, let's see, is this going to load? Load for me, load for me. Here we go. All right. Let's uh, make this. A little bit smaller. That's ridiculous. Smallest. There we go. Set. All right. So you did the claim there for. Um, we think logically. What'd you find about that? Did you personally believe this one? This one's a fairly simple one to believe. So. <sighs> oh, come on, where'd it go? Why is it not live? Excuse you. What happened? There it goes. Um, this is going great. <laughs> there it goes. It's struggling. Oh my god. Why are you struggling so much? Thank you. Thank you. No apostrophes with plurals. Humans tend to rely on emotions too much, so they don't think that logically. Okay, emotions. Clouded by emotions, won't see clearly. Spock! Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Love that use of the emoji. The hand emoji. Was not a logical thinker as he disclosed motion, which... I think he trailed off there. Whoever did that. Yeah, Spock was half human, so... Yeah, he was not as logical as he th thinks he is, or as not as logical as he think he was. You know. What else? We got any more coming down the pike here? Did it break? It probably broke. Yep. There we go. Oh, which helps make logical decisions. Gotcha.
bad. Ooh, how's everyone's uh, weekend while I'm waiting for more hits to hit here? How's everyone's weekend? Did you enjoy it? Did you have a good Easter? A happy Passover? I'm just going to drop the base here. Interesting. Alrighty, well, that's not happening. So, we did the We Think Logically. Ashton, they appear very slow. I don't know what's in. Ollie's doing school upstairs too, so maybe it's a internet thing, but so we're gonna move on. Uh, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad it was good, Nehemiah. I'm, uh, I'm glad it was good. All right. So we had a, a claim about logically thinking, and I think many of you uh, determined through your um, searching that it's not really a thing. It's not really a thing. Um, yeah, sure, we can reason logically, um, but do we do it most of the time? Probably not. So the idea is... Um, here I'm gonna make an argument about what rational, what what rationality is, versus what is logical. I think rational is a better identifier for humans than logical. Um, so my definition of rational is when we do, when we engage in in, in reasoning and we try to think of inferences and we try to think of um, why things are the way they are, um, or you know, causes and effects, that sort of, sort of thing, and draw sensible conclusions from that available information, that's rational, right? Um, and um, we can also expand that to include the idea that human reasoning appears to be more sensible than it is logical, right? So sensible is a better word, okay? Because... People without instruction will engage in sensible inference making, sensible conclusion drawing, um, sensible reasoning if they're not given any instructions, if you don't tell them explicitly this is how you um, reason, which is what technically what logic is. If any of you have ever had a philosophy course or any kind of um, logic um, instruction, it's essentially a set of rules, okay? And what are rules? They're instructions. When you go play a game, that's what they are, right? So I'm going to make this distinction here between what is rational and what is logical, okay? So logical has a very precise definition. Logical is literally following the rules of logic, okay? And if you don't, then it's not, okay? Rational, on the other hand, is what is sensible, what is reasonable, what is um, goal-oriented, what is what is pro-goals, okay? We do things that are um, toward our own goal-making, right? And goal-striving, um, goal okay? And lots of times, those two things, they overlap, okay? Lots of times, what is rational is logical, and lots of times what is logical can also be rational. But I want to pull them apart, okay? Um, and generally speaking, the overlap comes from thinking about it after the fact. Like, oh yeah, so I did that thing and I drew that conclusion and, and it just so happens that conclusion was right. That conclusion was the logical conclusion. Oh, hooray for me, bully for me, drink up me hearties, you know? But that's always after the decision or conclusion or action has already been made, right? Um, 
and many of us don't actually know what the rules of logic are, and so for this idea of it being post hoc, of course we're not thinking about what is logic when we are actually engaging in decision making process or the reasoning process. But once we think about it and somebody says, oh yeah, you know what, you did that in the logical order, you did that in the logical way, and you can be like, well, what are the rules of logic? Okay, that's that seems right, that seems what I did. And so it's always going to happen after, okay? It's always going to happen after. Um, so what is rational is not logical, and what is logical is not necessarily rational, okay? So I just want to throw that out there, that those two things are similar but not the same, okay? So I first wanna talk about deductive reasoning because this is, I'm gonna talk about my research um, today um, and, and show you that even when in the best of circumstances, we don't think logically, right? In the best of circumstances, we don't think logically. So a um, little bit of background for um, the research before I, you know, when I get to the research because People make these mistakes even when we don't talk about politics, right? So, deductive reasoning. So, this is review from earlier in the semester when we talked about ways of knowing, right? So, this is when a conclusion logically follows from the premises. What does that mean? Well, it means that that conclusion necessarily and only follows from the information given in the premises, okay? And so we're gonna take that idea and apply it to the simplest form of argument. So we have two premises and one conclusion. There are literally only three statements in a syllogism. Three statements, a full deductive argument, okay? And we're gonna use categorical syllogisms. I didn't go over these um, when we were talking about ways of knowing earlier in the semester. But um, categorical syllogisms use quantifiers to talk about the relationship between three things, because that is what we're going to do for this, is we're going to be talking about three things. So um, the quantifiers are all, no or none, depending on how you're, what you're talking about, right? Because no or none essentially mean the same thing. And then some... And then the opposite of that is some are not, or some, yeah, some are not. Um, and some, in this definition, does not mean like three or four or five, like we generally use in, in normal conversation. Some, in the precise logical definition, means one or possibly all, okay? So from one to possibly all. Yeah, it's a weird definition. So it, it, some exists in the space between none and all. So it can be any number of, of things in between. So some is a really, is a, I gotta say, it's a bitch to work with. Um, so how does this, how does this uh, work? Well, I'm gonna use a uh, example out of time. Okay, so this generally speaking comes from my cog psych lecture and that's in the fall and I'm generally talking about reasoning toward the end of the semester and so it's timely to talk about Santa Claus. It's not timely to talk about Santa Claus in April, though don't we wish it was December again <laughs> when things were normal. Okay, so here are my two premises. All jolly people are real. Santa Claus is jolly. Okay, perfect. We know all jolly people are real, and Santa Claus is jolly. Great. Conclusion. Santa Claus is real. Changed my mind. Ha 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 So, does this conclusion sound right to you? Sounds right to me, Santa Claus is real. Shh. Don't tell my kids. No, no. I don't know what those people are talking about, but you know what though? 
Let me show you another way. Remember I showed you for the conjunction fallacy what are called Euler circles? E-U-L-E-R for the guy who figured them out. <laughs> Madison, that's hilarious. Uh, well, well, she should probably leave the room. So here is my circle for jolly people. Okay, here's my circle for jolly people. Everyone with me so far? All jolly people exist within that circle. Now, here is my real people circle. Okay, now visually, these circles overlap according to the first sentence. But I, I, I gave a space in between to just show you the circles themselves, right? So all jolly people are real. Um, all jolly people are real. So those two circles technically overlap. I just wanted to visually separate them for the sake of this example. Okay. And so Santa Claus is jolly. So he fits within the, um, he fits within the jolly person circle. He is one case of a jolly person. Okay. And so thus, therefore, if he fits within the jolly circle, he must also fit within the real people circle. There you go. That's ironclad right there. That's ironclad reasoning. Is it though? I'm going to make some changes. All real people are jolly. Santa Claus is jolly. Therefore, Santa Claus is real. Same conclusion. I just switched the order of real and jolly in that first premise. Okay. I just switched the order. Okay. Same conclusion. Now I have a jolly person circle. Okay. Here's my jolly person circle. Here's my real person circle. Here's my real people circle. So all real people are jolly tells us somewhat about the relationship between real and jolly. Okay. Now, you could say, Dr. Son, why didn't you just make the circles overlap again? Well, that's a good point. Let me bring in Santa Claus being jolly. I'm going to put him outside the real person circle. Here's why I didn't make the real person circle the same size as the jolly person circle. It's because I have no information about how Santa Claus relates to real people. Okay. I have no information about that because of the order between real people and jolly. Okay. The ordering between those two things tells me nothing about the relationship between Santa and realness. Okay. In the previous example, in the previous slide, it does because all real pe all jolly people are contained within the real people circle. Here, all real people may be contained within the jolly people circle, but I do actually have to leave a space for one Chris Kringle. Okay. Good old Saint Nicolas. Okay. Popo Jojo. Okay. As they say in Poland, I guess. Um, so, if we compare the two, we have a situation of the first argument being valid valid while the second one is not valid okay um this actually uh forms what is called a formal logical fallacy which is called an undistributed middle because the term jolly ends both of these premises i have no relationship between real and santa claus and so the middle of this argument is undistributed between all three terms, okay? It's undistributed. So that's a formal logical fallacy. Lay, uh, and in a little bit, we'll talk about informal fallacies. I believe that you will most likely be familiar with, uh, at least some of them, okay? So now this brings up a very important point about validity and believability, okay? So if you are a um, functioning adult, you likely do not believe in Santa Claus. Santa Claus is not real. 
conclusions of both of those arguments, regardless of what the premises said, was that Santa Claus was real. Okay. Now, the first argument was valid. It had the same... It had the proper structure. Okay. Um, but the second one did not have the proper structure. Okay. So, valid arguments are based on structure, okay? So validity and truth are not the same thing. An argument could be 100% gobbledygook and still be a valid structure. So if I replaced all three terms in the first argument, then I'd have a valid argument, but it would be it would be gibberish. It would be gobbledygook, as I say. Right there. Okay. So val uh, validity is the structure of the argument. Believability has to do with the truth value of that argument. So if the premises are true, then the conclusion of a valid argument must be true. Okay. That's how deductive reasoning works. If the premises are true, then the conclusion of a valid argument must also be true. Okay. Now, that first argument that I showed you about all real people being, uh, all jolly people being real, that's not a true statement. Okay. It sounds true, but as a premise, it's not a true statement. Not all jolly people are real. Okay. I'm sure you can think of other characters that aren't real, that are jolly, that, that exist in real life. I mean, obviously, Santa Claus exists in real life in the sense that he, uh, you know, he's part of our lives, right? He's not, but he's fictional. I'm sure you can think of fictional characters that are also jolly, that thus aren't real. Flesh and bones. Alive on their own. Okay. And so because that premise is not true, that means the conclusion is not true. Yeah, zombie. Yeah, Easter Bunny, for sure. Recently, right. So that conclusion has tr a truth, uh, has a truth issue with it. It's a valid argument, but its truth is meh, and it doesn't, it's not that believable. At that point, then you could be like, well, it's not really believable, because, and so I don't need to believe it. But there is, therein lies the issue with reasoning, okay? Therein lies the issue with reasoning. And it has to do with the belief bias effect, which is what I'm going to talk about um, my research um, in just a moment. So... The belief bias effect is essentially a, uh, it, well, it's a bias. So we talked about biases last week, right? Um, it, it's the idea that um, if you if you come across a conclusion that you believe, okay, you'll think the conclusion is valid. You'll th I mean, the argument is valid. Excuse me, the argument is valid. And so this can this expands beyond just syllogisms. Although, I am going to talk about it in just in syllogistic form. But this is any argument that you think has a true conclusion or a believable conclusion that the argument itself is valid. When, of course, we already know that um, it takes a lot for a deductive argument to be valid. Okay, You have a lot of hurdles to jump over before any deductive argument is valid. <clears throat> so... Um, I'm just going to do that. It's annoying me. Uh, this also works the opposite way. That if conclusions aren't believable, like Santa Claus being real, you'll think the argument is invalid. And so that's the belief bias effect. And it's a fairly robust bias. Now, as far as understanding the causes of the bias or like the underlying um, cognitive quality of the bias, it's hard to know. There's a lot of research that, that 
surrounds belief bias effect. Um, and so we're getting close to figuring out why why it is what it is. But uh, I thought I I thought I'd talk about belief bias and, and politics. So so this work started with my master's thesis about ten years ago. Actually, yeah, we're we're coming up on ten years since my master's proposal. So this work started about ten years ago, um, and so I'm going to share with you um, my recent work with this, um, with a couple of my collaborators who were actually on my thesis committee. So one of my my master's advisor, and then um, a friend of mine who is at uh, Cal State San Diego. Um, we wanted to investigate whether or not political biases, that is, political ideology, um, interacts with this belief bias effect, okay? At least giving a reason for some of the, um, some of the seemingly interesting arguments that you hear uh, from both sides, okay? I'm going to try to be apolitical in my uh, description of this, okay? Um, so, there's very little work in formal reasoning and deductive reasoning. Um, oh, thanks. Thanks so much for the tip, zombie. I appreciate that. Um, so, there wasn't a lot of work. Now there is. <laughs> Now there is. So we, we kind of started the bandwagon, didn't um, didn't get the bandwagon going, and then another bandwagon came by and passed us. And so we jumped on that bandwagon because our bandwagon was stuck stuck in a ditch. So we were we were struggling, um, kind of. But we did get stuff. We did get a, a paper out last year, which I'll talk about here. Um, but prior to this, what I had found in my research was that there are a lot of distinctions between what we call um, political liberals and political conservatives on a continuum, on a spectrum. And I'm sure you have heard of this before as well. So an example of this is cognitive flexibility. Um, conservative um, folks, people who self-identify as conservatives, tend to be more cognitively rigid. They don't change their... Um, they don't change their minds, they don't change their attitudes, they don't change their um, uh, beliefs as frequently as people who don't identify as um, conservatives. Now again, this exists on a continuum, so I'm not trying to single out conservatives here for their political beliefs, I'm just saying that on a continuum, there is some correlation between cognitive flexibility and conservatism. Okay, and that's just one. That's just one measurement. There are plenty of other measurements that seemingly separate people who have a liberal ideology and a conservative ideology. Okay, and so since the 1920s, there has been work with syllogisms and the belief bias effect, although it didn't really hit a really big stride until the methodology of uh, one researcher in the 1980s that like really nailed the effect down. Um, and so the general knowledge belief bias effect was actually, is actually fairly robust. And I'll go ahead and talk about um, how then that applies to uh, um, politics. Okay, so here's a political syllogism. Now, this is an old one. This is an old one from my, all the way back from my master's thesis. It does not reflect the new syllogisms that we used in this 2019 paper. Um, but you can sort of get the gist from it. And I made these materials before. I made these slides well before. I just updated the um, images to the new, the new data. But um, so imagine here we have a premise. All things that have been exaggerated need scientific support. Okay, claims of global warming need scientific support. And you can see that I, I don't actually have climate change written there. So this is obviously written before the uh, rebranding of global warming to climate change. 
regardless, it's obviously a thing, right? Um, and so here's the conclusion. Claims of global warming have been exaggerated. So that's what you would take from it, right? Um, this has the same structure as the second argument that we um, we looked at, right? So it's an invalid argument, and the, the conclusion itself is um, what we would have pretested as a conservative conclusion, right? So you've you've heard this from conservative uh, folks, and uh, whether they be politicians or pundits. Uh, that claims of global warming have been exaggerated. Now, this one's a little shaky f even now because people are just pretty much on the climate change bandwagon right now and on the climate change bus. Whether or not we do anything about it is a different story, but at least at least we're on the bus, okay? Where the bus is going, probably over the flat earth, earth edge, but be that as it may. So this is an example of a, a conservative conclusion that's fit within an invalid argument. Now, we had all four, all four kinds. We had conservative conclusions that were also valid, okay? So that's the second one to, to this group here, okay? So if I just change the wording a little bit, I could make, I could make this one, I could make this one valid. Still a conservative conclusion. Then we also had valid liberal arguments, and we also had valid, uh, invalid liberal arguments, okay? And so we gave these uh, to uh, uh, hundreds of people who self-identified somewhere on this liberal conservative spectrum, okay? And then we compared their, um, their answers on, what was it, 16 arguments, I think? Four of each kind? Okay, four of each kind, we compared their output, and we uh, looked at how well they did from a logical standpoint, that is, determining whether or not a conclusion is valid or invalid, versus their conservatism. So down here on the uh, x-axis is a person's conservatism. Zero here represents moderate. And um, positive numbers represents cons more conservative, and negative numbers represents less conservative, so more liberal in in on the spectrum, right? And then here is their bias on the reasoning task, okay? Where um, positive numbers, rep so zero means no bias, positive numbers represents a, uh, a bias toward conservative conclusions and then negative numbers represents a bias toward liberal conclusions and you can see there's a positive slope to this regression line that is to say that the higher the participants conservatism the higher their bias toward conservative conclusions okay now so that was um, experiment one. This is experiment two. Why is that? Oh, I don't have a period. Oh, God. So silly. Thanks, zombie. See you later. Um, here is our second experiment. And again, same thing on the x-axis is participants conservatism and conservative bias. Okay. On the y-axis. And again, we saw a similar effect. This effect was a little bit smaller. Um, so experiment one was done on um, San Diego, San Diego students, college students. So they were at San Marcos, uh, Cal State San Marcos, down in uh, San Diego County, north of the city of San Diego. And experiment two was done uh, was um, collected on um, uh, on MTurk. I wonder if you're all familiar with uh, Mechanical Turk, Amazon's Mechanical Turk. You can make some money if you are bored. You can go become a um, you can go become a uh, worker on that and uh, make some money by doing um, research studies. Because it's pretty much research studies now. It's market research and research studies. That's about it. Um, so you can <laughs> you can go do that if you need need some money right now. Uh, but that was that was this that that's this group here. Um, which is why you see slightly a, a bigger spread. Uh, we got a much 
more representative sample from the internet, which is hit or miss sometimes. But uh, and 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 people have qualms about MTurk uh, these days. But it's um it's a decent you know it's a, it's a decent uh, place to get it. But you can see it's a bigger spread, and thus the correlation itself is flatter. Okay, if you if you just compare the two slopes, right? It's flatter. Okay. So, does that mean there is a, a there is a bias when um, evaluating political arguments? I would say the answer is yes. Just very, very quickly, a very quick elevator pitch answer is that yes, there is. Now, what's the reason for that? Well, there could be a number of reasons for that. We could be lazy, okay? We could be stuck in our echo chambers. We don't have all of the information. We are um, um, giving into authority. There, there are a number of reasons why we might have this bias, but be that as it may, there is that bias there, and um, I think there's enough research that that shows that um, even when trying to evaluate an argument's validity, believability, which comes from ideology does stamp down the ability to um get that logical get that logic get that logical and the reason why i bring up politics is because and and my work on this is because um i mean the answers that were on the the the, the two or three things that came through on uh, poll everywhere were talking about emotion and so obviously i this is one of the more emotional things right now, right? Is is arguments, political arguments. They get very emotional, don't they? So that's that's um, that's my research. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Um, I'm gonna skip dual task methodology. Guess what? You don't need to know it because I want to get to informal informal arguments. Okay, so. Now, we've we've talked about the analysis of an argument. Now we're going to move from syllogisms to broader arguments that generally speaking are probably going to have informal fallacies. These are informal. So everything that I've talked about pre uh, now since then, since what am I saying? Everything I talked about previously has been a formal fallacy. So like undistributed middle that's a formal logical fallacy. Here I'm going to take broader arguments that are, you know, bigger than three sentences, and I'm going to um, show you what informal fallacies. Okay, so these don't necessarily break the rules of logic, they just break the rules of um, proper argumentation. Okay. And so you're going to see claims Hey, that word sounds familiar, right? Support, okay, and counterarguments. Now, claims and support, that comes from one person, okay? Generally speaking, okay? It's what your position is. Support is the evidence that you use to support that claim. So those are your premises. So if we were to take this here and apply it to a syllogism sense, support is my premises, claim is my conclusion, okay? And then somebody else will come along and be like, no, okay? Because this is a counter argument, get it? <laughs> yes, no. I'm sorry, but if you don't get it, I can't help you. Um, so generally speaking, a lot of the informal fallacies that we're going to talk about um, come from a bad counter argument, a bad faith counter argument. Some of them we discuss will come from a bad faith claim. So the the initial argument. Okay. So we're going to talk about one of those two. Okay. So we're going to specifically look for the fallacies or errors. Okay, so that's why it's asterisks. That's what we are going to uh, finish with for the next uh, 15, 20, yeah, 20 minutes. 
Um, so, but in any case, I think this slide here, if you just paused here and looked at this slide for, it will help you for the rest of your life, right? Um, and not blindly following arguments, okay? So let's talk about logical fallacies. So there are a lot of them, okay? There are a lot of them. If you went to Wikipedia and typed in logical fallacies, the list article will probably, it's over 20, I think, something like that. Um, I have a bunch here on this. I, I have a bunch here on this, okay? Um, we have uh, syllogism, okay? Most of the green is touching the red, right? These in you have to have this visual image with this. Most of the red is touching the blue, true. That since most of the green is touching the red, most of the red is touching the blue, most of the green must be touching the blue. Obviously that's not true, right? That, that, that's a that's a bad faith argument 100%. Um that is uh it has a name, I can't think of it. Um there is a uh, another one that's called a true Scotsman, okay. Um, and the idea is behind a true Scotsman that uh, there is no true Scotsman, um, that there's just so much inter uh, interbreeding and b among various peoples that settled in Scotland that there's actually no true Scotsman. And the great thing about that this this uh this picture here is it's combining true scotsman with a slippery slope okay so obviously um you know we'll talk about uh slippery slope because i think it's fun i think it's fun uh veterinarians link to higher brain power or veg vegetarians not veterinarian <laughs> vegetarians um this is a uh news article from uh an Australian paper, and it's 100% super garbage. It it follow it. It's basically a um, an attempt at. It's a bad faith attempt at um, post hoc ergo propter hoc. So correlation being causation. Obviously, that's not real, as we've discussed already. Um, uh, so yeah, I don't know if you consider yourself a vegetarian. Uh, I don't think higher brain power is is really what's happening. Okay, so here are three. Here are three. So glittering generalities sound good with no concrete argument. Okay, glittering generalities sound good, no concrete argument. You hear these a lot. You hear glittering generalities a lot from Do uh, from President Trump. Um, I'm not trying to to use him as a, uh, to, you know, as in a bad faith attempt. Uh, but I, I, I do want to say that he always says things like, I know it, everybody knows it, it's a thing. Or, in, you know, insert whatever thing here. I mean, he, it, it's a, um, it's a verbal fallback for him when he does that. And so those are what are called glittering generalities. I mean, it sounds good. If everyone knows it, that's great. Um, but there's no argument. There's no evidence to support what, how everyone knows it or wh why everyone knows it or what is the thing that everyone knows. Okay. A hasty generalization um, is um, this uh, conclusions come from too little evidence. So I'm going to use this sheep here. New animal uh, is like a sheep. Four legs, sheep shies, fleecy. Therefore, come to a flock. But obviously... It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Right, so that's a hasty generalization. And then we've already sort of talked about post hoc, ergo propter hoc, um, or just false cause. Is You can just call it false cause from now on. You don't have to be walking around like, I know Latin. Post hoc, propter, ergo, propter hoc. Rah, 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 rah. Okay, you don't need to do that. But... Post hoc ergo propter hoc, you can see right here. I bowled a... Oh, see, these two lobsters. They've been cooked, by the way, because they are bright red. So they are actually not alive. Okay. I bowled a perfect game right after finding this pebble. It must have given me good luck. It's just a pebble. I'm sure those of you who have superstitions can relate. 
Okay. Here are a few different ones. All cats have four legs. I have four legs, therefore I'm a cat. Hey, look, that's a hasty generalization. Uh, Calvin and Hobbes, I don't think we've got enough information now, don't you? I think we've got a, enough information now, don't you? All we have is one fact you made up. That's plenty. By the time we add an introduction, a few illustrations, a conclusion, it will look like a graduate thesis. That's a glittering generality. Look, it's a strange beam of light moving through the sky. I don't know what it is, so it must be aliens visiting us from another planet. Like, really, dude? Um, this, by the way, is from a m wonderful book. Book of Bad Arguments. Um, Masood, oh, uh, I can't think of his last name. I have the book in my office. Um, and he made a Book of Bad Arguments 2 that I need to get my hands on. You know, that's a, Christ, uh, a birthday present. Another one here uh, for those first three. At the end of the every night and shortly before dawn, this is a post hoc. This is a false cause. The beaver walks all the way to the top of the mountain and asks the sun to come out. The sun always does. He can see the sun has a watch on. And he's like, hmm, where is he? I think that's fun. Um, slippery slope. Okay. This is when um, you claim a dire chain reaction will happen with little evidence. I'm going to play just the first part. If you've seen DirecTV ads in recent in recent years, I would say in the last 10 years, then you have seen these slippery slope ads of getting rid of cable and moving to DirecTV. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm going to play this. I'll probably get copyright flagged, but oh well. I'm gonna play when like you pay two too of them. much for cable, you feel down. When you feel down, you stay in bed. When you stay in bed, they give your job to someone new. When they give your job to someone new, he has a lot to learn. When he has a lot to learn, mistakes are made. And when mistakes are made, you get body slammed by a lowland gorilla. Don't get body slammed by a lowland gorilla. Get rid of cable and upgrade to Direct TV. Call 1 800 Direct TV. When you have cable and can't record all your shows, you feel unhappy. When you feel unhappy, you go to happy hour. When you go to happy hour, you're up for anything. When you're up for anything, you head to a Turkish bathhouse. When you head to a Turkish bathhouse, you meet Charlie Sheen. And when you meet Charlie Sheen, when you he was reenact relevant. scenes from Platoon with Charlie Sheen. Don't reenact scenes from Platoon with Charlie Sheen. Get rid of cable and upgrade to DirecTV. Call 1-800-DIRECTV. Alright. There is, at this link, it's the full compilation. If you want to watch all of them, I suggest it. So, DirecTV, Get Rid of Cable, full compilation, available on YouTube. I recommend it. It's a fun time. But, as you can see, that's the slippery slope. It's the, you know, the, the chain reaction of things that are happening, you know, getting body slammed by a lowland gorilla, uh, or reenacting scenes with, uh, uh, from Platoon with Charlie, Charlie Sheen. Oh, my god. Um... That probably involves some cocaine, so I would I would stay away from there. Okay, um, and there's no evidence for any of those links, right? Because you're not happy doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna go to happy hour, you know. Just because you you're like, oh, oh shush. Here are some other ones. Oh look, it's a ski slope, and that's what it's based on, right? If you give a mouse a cookie, this whole book is a slippery slope. The whole premise of this book is a slippery slope. If you ever read it as a child, or read it to a child, it actually becomes very apparent. Um, but the book is also about having to, has to, has a, I think, everything to do with um, you know handouts, welfare, those sorts of things. It's so dumb. Um, yeah, if you give a mouse a cookie, well, he's gonna move in, and he's gonna start taking dumps all over your floor. And um, then you're going to get a rat disease, uh, even though it's a mouse. And um, when you get that rat disease, you start turning into a rat. Um, and then when you start turning to a rat, you find four turtles that were bathed, bathed in radioactive ooze. And um, when you find four turtles raised, you know, bathed in radioactive ooze, you raise them as uh, ninjas. Okay. That's what happens when you give a mouse a cookie. And uh, if you let Billy come in from the front yard, he will be on your porch the next day, and the day after that, he will eat your babies. Wow. That escalated quickly. All right. Weak analogies. 
So you know like when you compare apples to oranges? <laughs> See, it's right there. Apples to oranges. Don't worry, I am here. It's Tuesday. I am here till today with my jokes. So we can analogies have to do with comparing two things that aren't really alike. Penguins are black and white. Some old TV shows are black and white. Therefore, some penguins are old TV shows. I mean, what? Okay, buddy. Somebody needs to go back to school. Noisy children are a real headache. An aspirin will make a headache go away. Therefore, an aspirin will make noisy children go away. If only this worked! <laughs> if only this worked. Although, insert ibuprofen for aspirin because I don't want a blood thinner. <sighs> Save me. And I think the easiest one to ga gather here is two is a number, one is a number, two equals one. Really, does it? It does. Moving on. Straw man. Hey, look. It's, uh... Um, okay, yeah, Ashlyn, big facts, as a kid's I nanny, you're screaming at each other in the room fighting over a toy. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> if only. Oh, you guys are babysitters. Oh, man. If I had a babysitter right now. <sighs> Anywho, straw man. All right, so here we have the, uh, scarecrow. It's full of straw and straw kept coming out if you recall the film um we have uh where you this is where you make an argument specifically weaker by responding to that bad faith argument so here we have the argument here is your straw man i'm gonna punch that one i'm gonna punch that one down that's where my counter argument's gonna go so that's a straw man Okay, the, the, how uh, Book of Bad Arguments illustrates it is, the energetic, muscular, and colorful toucan was completely misrepresented by one of the artists. Later on, he showed the audience his painting and criticized how dull and lifeless the toucan had looked, right? So this particular thing is the straw man, okay? That's the straw man argument. And um, these are one of the uh, more insipid bad faith arguments because... If you say, hey, you're doing a straw man, then the uh, counter arguer is going to be like, no, I'm not. And then you basically are going back with, you are, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. And like that, that then has devolved, right? All right. Next is a red herring. Okay. This is taking a argument uh, off on a tangent, okay, of irrelevance, okay, to distract people. And the reason why it's called red herring is because actually herrings are not red. They are gray. They are grayish brownish when you catch them in the wild. But when you smoke them, they become red okay which is not actually what the what the herring is okay herrings were used to um confuse the scents for hounds you know hounds uh, scent hounds um confuse them okay um because they are very pungent they are very pungent, and as somebody who does not like the smell of fish, if I smell herring, I am the F out of there. Um, so, they are used in this way as a logical fallacy, is because you're trying to distract your your ar counter-arguer, right, with a, um, a line of thinking that doesn't matter, okay? Red herrings are used in murder mysteries, uh, whodunits, okay, where you, like, you know... Um, either the murderer or the the done it the the person who done it um, is trying to take everyone who's investigating and lead them down this one path when the truth is down the next path. Okay. False dichotomies. I'm not gonna play 
this one, but I really enjoy it as a description of false dichotomies. It's all the Isaiah Mustafa versus Terry C Cruz commercials for Old Spice. And the idea is that they are two different characters. Um, and it's either or. And they, they play off each other really well. And it's either or, either or. It's like, you know, and they're obviously, they're hawking two different uh, products for Old Spice. Um, but a false dichotomy is when you take two choices and both are equally crappy okay but one of them is even worse and so you're trying to make the other crappy choice um seem a lot better okay by saying that this other one is just completely awful and this is a real war advertisement uh slash pop propaganda poster from world war ii in um, england it is far better to face bullets than to be killed at home by a bomb. Join the army at once and help stop an air raid. God save the king. What? I, I only have two choices? Being shot at or blown up? That sounds freaking awful. I don't want to do either of those. Okay. And so the idea is it's better to be shot at than blown up. Okay. So that's a false dichotomy because being shot at and being blown up aren't at all the same and they're both bad right um i believe that human cloning is wrong of course you would say that you're an idiot of course you would say that you're an idiot sorry we can't do that and then the last one that i want to share with you is ad hominem and this is probably one that you have seen before in all sorts of in all sorts of uh media okay whether it be fictional media cable news media um other sorts of things wrestling wwe you have probably seen some severe ad hominems attacks okay um the idea behind this is that uh you just resort to name calling as a counter argument okay resort to name calling um attacking the person's personal attributes or character instead of their argument like you're a duty head and that's why your argument stinks okay so here are two geese who are yelling at each other we share many genetic char characteristics with ducks because we've evolved from a common ancestor hey left duck is right left duck is right and then right duck is like you're closed-minded and stupid and you eat corn you don't know anything right duck is an asshole Okay, that's my ad hominem attack to his or her ad, ad hominem attack. Okay. Uh, yeah, Julia can, um, did I say duck? I meant geese. I called them geese at the start. Um, yes, Julia, you're right. Um, attacking the source. Sure. Uh, with all due respect, your highness, how can we entertain the ideas of a dog who developed his ideas while on the street? <gasps> That's mean. That's just mean. Right? That's rude and mean, and why? Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Um, so, anyways, that's it. Those are, are the, those are the logical, uh, excuse me, the, um, uh, informal logical fallacies. Uh, that'll be it for today's class. If, um, you have any questions about those, feel free to email me. Um, and, uh, I will be, uh, back 